two days ago I received an uh, email from, from a guy in the Coordinator General's Department called Scott Taylor. I'll read it to you because it, it's, it's had a major impact on how I see things. Hi John, my name is Scott Taylor and I am the Landholder Liaison Manager for the Department of State Development for the Galilee Basin State Development Area. The Coordinator General has requested that I call you and it has been brought to his attention by the member for Gregory, Lachlan Miller, MP. Lachlan promised me he'd talk to the Coordinator General, at least he did that, so give him some credit for that. That you are concerned with the location of the proposed GVK line. I've tried to call you today to discuss any queries you may have. However, the phone rang out. Our phones are out of action. None of you guys would understand that. I don't imagine that occasionally they will go out. <coughs> If you have any queries or concerns regarding the proposed GVK line or the state development area in general, please feel free to contact me. <clears throat> Let's go back to where we started. And we started as, as our group, the, the uh, C to C corridor to coast group in 2011. Prior to that, there was a consultative process where Hancock Mining came and saw us and told us where they were going to put the railway line. That was called the consultative process. Landholders all along that line received the same treatment and we decided that it probably wasn't quite acceptable to us. We probably needed to do something more constructive about it. But this wasn't a fight between the grazing industry and mining. This was simply a group of landholders who were going to have a railway line through their properties. Now the guys who live next door to us are sympathetic, they're empathetic, but they're not impacted. So it's not their fault. It's not their fight, it's our fight. So as a group of landholders, we felt we had to get involved in the discussion process and have some input. Diane Hughes, Shantae Moran, Peter Anderson, Sean Dillon, Tony Mankins, Richard Simmons, Graham Acton, Paula Heelan, Marcel Hall, Trish Dennis. There's been a whole group of landholders involved. They're all impacted by railway lines. There's 40 landholders that are impacted. And that's now grown up to about 100 with the Adani line that came in as well after that time. So we organised a, a, a discussion group to get together and talk about it and we elected a steering committee. This was a deliberate action to have a steering committee, not a new organisation. We set up as a group that will, will argue this case and if we think we've lost it, we'll walk away. There's no, there's no legal structure in it. We're just a, a, a lobby group who will be arguing a case on the railway lines. So in uh, 2011, May, we had a delegation to Brisbane to meet with the Treasurer, uh, Andrew Fraser, and his staff, and, and we also met with the Opposition Leader, Campbell Newman, and we met with Andrew Cripps. Out of those meetings to Brisbane, we uh, managed to arrange a meeting in Claremont with Coordinator General Keith Davies and four of his staff members who were involved in the in the, in the planning and coordination of the development of the Galilee Basin. They decided to come to Claremont. We arranged helicopter flights, we flew them all over the area, we, uh, we picked them up, we put them down, we had discussions, we organised a meeting in Claremont for them to address the whole group and we also organised for the local community, the town community, to come to, that, uh, to get that meeting and to also have dinner with these guys afterwards so that they could get a pretty good understanding of what we are on about. After that, of course, there was a change of government. We just thought we had, uh, had Keith Davies on side, and there was a change of government. With a new minister, Minister Seney, and a new coordinator general, a bloke called Barry Bro, who I said I'd spoken to half a dozen times, but it was now asking if I've got any problems. Um, and I think it's fair to say that the outcomes and the, the process of, of, 
of the whole issue became a lot harder with a government who were supposed to be our, our friends and supporters. And that, that reached a climax when finally Minister Senior declared a state development area over most of that area. The map up here is what, what we're talking about. That, ladies and gentlemen, is the Galilee Basin. Alpha in the bottom, Hewenden in the north. There's a few little mines down here, is where Hancock GVK are. There's one up in the middle here where Adani is. There's more up here where Mac Mines are. There's more up here that the Mac Mines land. You can see we're not talking about a small area. You can also see it didn't pop up like a pimple overnight and it suddenly appeared. It's been there for a long time. We've had governments for years who knew that was there and knew that it was going to be one day a resource that would be available to the state of Queensland. But within 12 months, we had a railway line here proposed, I've coloured it in in black because that's the Hancock GVK line which is still there. We had another one through the middle from Waratah Cull. We had one coming from Adani going across to Murrumbah to link up with the present system. We had another one from uh, Adani that was going to take us up to join into the missing link and run coal trains up to uh, Bowen that way. We had another proposal from, a, from the East West Link group who want to uh, establish coal mines in, coal, take coal from Queensland to Western Australia to process iron ore and bring iron ore from West Australia to Queensland to, uh, to, to process it here. And they came up with two more proposals for rail lines that run down the side of the Galilee Basin. In the other shaded area here, we have the, the Belliando floodplain. And over on this side, we have the Sutter River floodplain. They come together at a point here at the, uh, at the Belliando crossing, and then they join into the Burdekin River and into the Burdekin Dam down here. So we're talking about a pretty big area of Queensland. And we're talking about an area that, that we as a group felt needed some realistic futuristic planning of how this whole development should take place. So we had to, had to become involved in that discussion. And to do that, we had to understand who we were and what we were. The first thing we had to all realise was that we all carry some baggage. Our baggage was that we were the ones that were going to be threatened with the railway line cutting across our properties. We also have to recognise that that railway line, if that development goes ahead, will have to go somewhere. We weren't naive enough to think that stopping it on our properties was going to be a solution. The other thing we had to recognise was that there will be compensation payable, and that was grasped by everybody in our group, that if the railway line went through our property, we would receive compensation. And depending how strong our case was, would depend on the amount of compensation we received. So that was, that was all absorbed and accepted by our group. We were also not going to get involved in the discussion about stopping the mines in the Galilee Basin. That's another argument for a different group of people who have a different understanding and a comprehension of what that really means. All we know is that it's a bloody big area and to get the coal from there to the coast is going to require a railway line. So our approach was to find the best possible route that a, for that railway line to go, where it'd have the minimal impact on our communities and it'd have the maximum value for the state of Queensland in the long term. The long-term long future of the state would be enhanced by having that line in the right place. They were the parameters that we set as our steering group for that discussion. Now, as I say, we had the baggage that we were the ones that were directly involved. If we hadn't been directly involved, I'd imagine we would have been sitting at the, at the pub 
saying how sorry we were for those poor buggers who had the railway line. But we were the guys who were in it, so we had to do something. As part of the history of this area, in the 1990s, there was work done by government to establish possible future farming country and possible future dam sites that could be, could be uh, developed. There was one about here at Naranya, just south of Alpha, and there's another one on the Burdekin uh, up in, in um, Eaglefield that were developed as potential dam sites. The landholders in those areas were given instructions that they were not allowed to develop that country. <coughs> the Eaglefield site was something like that. The red line was the Sutter River. The dam site was in blue and those landholders were advised not to touch it. The proposal for the railway line cut straight through the middle of it. We raised that issue as one reason why that railway line probably shouldn't be there. And we were advised that if it, ever, if it ever became a dam site, we'd shift the railway line. <coughs> I'd like, like you to just envision what this country looks like. If you take your, your left hand and you point your fingers to the south, On the, on the right hand side we have the Bellyando River. They all start back up in the hills. We have the Bellyando River, we have a mob of smaller rivers and creeks run through the middle. And on the left hand side, where your thumb is, is the Sutter River coming in. The road from Claremont to Charters Towers was built on the high country, running down through the middle with a minimal crossing. Those rivers all start in the hills, as rivers do, and as they come down together, into that floodplain area, down through here, those rivers intertwine, water runs one way in one wet season, another way in another wet season. They're an integrated mass of floodplain. And it doesn't mean it all gets flooded every year, but it all has the potential to be flooded. The present Adani line has an area in one spot there's 30 kilometres which all went underwater in 2008, in one hit. Now I'm not an engineer and I'm not a hydrologist, but I do have a reasonable understanding that when you've got a, a water system that's 30 k's wide, you've got a bloody lot of water to deal with. And it's reasonable to assume that if you're going to build that railway line on a bank of dirt, that water will probably be slowed down. But that's not an issue because we're going to have three metre diameter pipes and they'll be 25 metres apart. Hydrologists work this stuff out. So we put three metre diameter pipes 25 metres apart and we run water two foot deep through the bottom of them. Logic says to me that we're not going to get three metre diameter pipe full of water out the other side. Like we haven't got university training, but we do have a little bit of common sense. And a little bit of common sense tells us that the water will be blocked on the top side, and where you concentrate it and run it down the channel on the other side, you're going to get erosion. So there's a reasonable argument there that perhaps it could be a better place to build a railway line. Of those proposals, the yellow lines were certainly the most suited. They stay on the western side of the water. They have the potential to get around the main water. And when they get down past the floodplain, they cross the river where it becomes your arm. You can bridge it in five kilometres. You can reduce the impact on the whole of that floodplain structure. And you can get, get the, the trains across without creating environmental damage. You don't impact on the long-term benefits of those floodplains. You still have the potential, 500,000 acres of potential farming country in that area and with the 
development of irrigation dams, that potential could be realised. If we had a rail system that had that ability to cart produce out as well as coal, that was built for the long term, that provided access into that eastern desert uplands, which is now Goanna country because no one can get there, we felt there were a few good reasons why a government might consider taking a lead in developing this whole process. And so that was the argument that we were presenting. We weren't whinging to government that we were going to be impacted by a railway line. We were trying to develop a potential benefit for the state of Queensland that would, be, would have long term an impact for the state. Now our campaign was thought through reasonably well. Our aim was to convince the, the broader community that there was a case to be answered. And anyone who saw any of our, our uh, publicity efforts, and they're very amateurish, we realised that, but we are having a go at showing to the community what the impacts would be if the railway lines were built in the wrong place. We weren't aiming to present a case that, that we can't have this railway across our property because it's going to impact us. But one of the strongest visions I have from that whole campaign was the Moran family, Shantae and Brendan and their kids, standing and defending their right to farm their property. Not because it was going to impact on their property, but because it was going to impact on their region. And that was one of the strongest images I have of, of any of the work we did. So as a group, we had to maintain our focus and use all means available to achieve outcomes. And that, that led to a few novel ideas, but we did nothing that was radical or, or aggressive to anyone in the community. We had to accept that if we were able to shift that railway line, it was going to impact somebody else. It wasn't that it was going to go away. It was going to go from those properties across the floodplain onto other properties. So we were in constant discussion with people in that area that would be impacted. A lot of them already were going to be impacted on the better country and they were quite happy for it to be on the higher country out further west where it wouldn't impact on their floodplains. We found the media was important in that campaign. We had to have the media. But unfortunately you can only run a story once. You run the story, you do it as well as you can, but the next time you run, you have to have a different angle. And I guess we tried as many angles as we could until we ran out of angles. But that, to do that successfully, to present that image to the broader public, we had to be able to get that story out there. We developed a Facebook page. Believe it or not, I actually put, put a uh, comment on Facebook Never going to happen again, never happened before. But I recognise, genuinely recognise, that there is a big place in our future campaigns to look at how that, that social media can work. We need a younger group of people to be doing this stuff, but there is definitely a lot of benefit in there. And if you don't believe it, sometimes just have a look at the What If campaigns and the Get Up campaigns and the Mackay Conservation Group. The groups who are actually making a difference are spending a lot of time on social media and not too worried about the newspapers. The other thing we found was that government is not the solution. No matter which party is in power, the power is in Brisbane. Even though I recognise Lachlan as a eloquent, well-spoken representative for our group, when he goes to Brisbane, he's confronted by the fact that he represents, or his, his constituents represent 5% of the electorate. We can't expect him to perform miracles. He can only achieve what he can achieve by speaking about the issues. When it comes to the vote, 
There's other people that have got a lot of other issues that they're concerned about as well. And the, and the, the, the power base in Queensland is the southeast corner. And until we recognise that and start to respond to that, we're going to have a battle getting our arguments through. The other thing we had to come to grips with was that it's not a marathon. Uh, it's not a sprint, it's a marathon. We had to be prepared and we weren't prepared for a five year fight. We thought we'd just land a few hits and it'd all be over. We'd get the obviously simple message. Um, we should be able to sort this out pretty quickly. But it's not simple, it's not quick, and it's like playing tennis. When they hit the ball to you, you've got to be ready to hit it back. But don't jump over the net and try and hit it again. Well, that's the approach that we've taken. So where are we at the moment? Well, the first thing that's obvious is there's been nothing happening in the Galilee Basin. There's been a lot happen, there's been a lot of talk, a lot of waffle, but nothing has actually happened. Legal representation and legal opinion has encouraged 95% of the landholders on the Adani line, which is the most likely line to go ahead at this stage. 95% of landholders have uh, signed a compensation, conduct and compensation agreement with, with Adani. Now whether they are, our campaign has helped them to achieve a better resolve or not, we don't know. We've been able to keep those landholders informed of what the arguments are up to. The landholder agreements are in confidence agreements. We don't need to know that. But I'd like to think that in some ways we've been able to help that. But the reality is people do need to move on. They can't sit there hoping that one day that railway line will go to a different place. They have to, have to accept that it's where it is. That, <coughs> that, that brings me to another issue and that was the de declaration of the state development area. As we thought we were making progress, Sini and his government then put out the state development area over much of that area. We were able to successfully get it reduced to two lines they're the two black lines that are there now, but there's a state development area on all properties in that area. Our property, Frankfield, has the red line of the state development area marked through the middle of it. Whether we like it, whether we agree with it, whether it's ever going to be used, it's there and it will impact on the value of our property. Landholders in the uh, Wandawan area although there's no proof of anything, estimate up to 30% devaluation in their properties. Because of, this. because of the declaration of the state development area, you cannot sell that property without making note of that. We had no value added to our properties. We have no guarantee there will ever be a railway line built. And I still don't know how we get rid of that. So the Adani project is on hold for 12 months. The Hancock GVK have stopped all negotiations. We don't know where they're up to. And no government that we've worked with has shown vision beyond three years. We've not been able to get anyone to discuss seriously any of our thoughts about the long-term development of our region. The long-term potential of the Billiando Sutter floodplain to help feed the world remains ignored while the federal government continues to discuss developing the north, whatever that means. Robbie Catter this week moved to have a commissioner appointed to establish a rail network to service the Galilee Basin. Wish you well, Robbie. But I think it's too far down the track to start at the beginning again. If there is a commission appointed, I think they'll be looking at those uh, st uh, state development areas as they stand. And landholders still have little rights in negotiations except for compensation. That's the only thing that we really can do in the finish is negotiate a, a com conduct and compensation agreement. 
Now, in November last year, Sini came out and uh, offered to put some money into building the railway lines for, for the uh, Adani line. And that was the one time that prompted me to, to contribute on Facebook. I checked back to what I'd said. I still think it applies pretty well. It is ironical that the Queensland Government should choose to now offer to finance the rail link for Adani when world bankers are backing away from the project. Claremont Coal has recently sacked over 100 employees, many of them Claremont residents with families committed to the local community, kids at schools and partners involved in making the town work. We need a government with a long-term vision for our community. This does not include another fly-in, fly-out mine with no local commitment. This does not include destroying the Meliando Sutter floodplain's potential for future agricultural production. And this does not include building a rail line that could offer so much more for a community that the short-term development, <coughs> so much more for a community than the short-term development of a new coal mine. We need real investment for real jobs for real people committed to rural Queensland. Mr. Sini has failed Queensland when so much more is on offer. Mr. Sini is re-elected to Parliament, but the government is gone. I think this all had something to do with it. It would seem, a long, it would seem the opportunity for long-term development of the Eastern Desert Uplands and the Galilee Basin may have been lost. And that, to me, is the biggest tragedy of the whole thing, that the potential to make use of that resource has got further away rather than closer, I believe. We wait to see what happens. Thank you.